Let us give the Lord thanks here all over again. Praise the Lord for his goodness and his blessing. Thank the Lord for his mercy. Thank God for his graciousness. We appreciate you, O oh Lord, so much today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. If you'll remain standing here just for a moment before we read the um, good word of God. I am so overwhelmed by the Spirit and so full today of, um, of uh, emotions that are growth in their root and uh, purpose, outflow, and so thankful to be here to be a part of our family and of our heritage. Praise God. We are rich people today. <laughs> yes, we're rich. And I'm so thankful to be a part <clears throat> of the, this body of believers that is so unique and so different and uh, cut <clears throat> with the scissors of God's purpose from the cloth of His will. Praise God, and I appreciate it so much. Thank God. I thank the Lord for this meeting because of the times. I appreciate so much this church and my dear friends, the Mangans, and the hand of God that is upon Brother Anthony. I appreciate uh, what I see in the lives of many of our younger preachers, that some of them are so hungry and sincere. Some of them already have come past some problems that I had and did not work my way through until I was older in age. Some already know what true values are and what true priorities are and know that, uh, as Brother, Brother Shoemake preached today, what uh, really counts, and I'm thankful for that. Now they can get on with it, and uh, I'm very thankful for that. All that matters is Jesus. Yeah. Praise God. Yes, sir. <laughs> He's all that matters. <laughs> He's all that matters. To know Him, thank God, is to have life eternal. Yes, is. Praise God. And uh, <clears throat> we want to look full in His wonderful face. Praise the Lord. And I appreciate so much the drive, the hunger that is rising like an irresistible tide across our fellowship. And the meetings that are held about our fellowship are accenting that. And we are less and less preaching and accenting prejudices and things of this nature, but we are more and more lifting up Jesus, and we are being gathered to him and around him. And I'm very thankful for that. And I don't believe that for one moment that we will, <clears throat> we will compromise doctrine, nor a holiness standard, praise God, nor principle, but uh, that we are finding these centered in Jesus Christ. And we are grateful for that. Very, very grateful for that. We appreciate it so much. And I am hoping and trusting that never again will we have another general conference that are like so many used to be. I am trusting that we will always have the early morning prayer and that we will reach for God, that as Brother Tinney has said, we will make the main thing the main thing. Amen. And this is our reason for being and for the purpose that Jesus Christ died. And I, I'm thankful that we are getting our eyes open to that. And I have so muchly appreciated the feeling of evangelism, and I have felt that so deep within me and the Men that are still on their feet now, that had their beginning at the time that myself, and the Mangans, the Dees, the, brother, the Urshans, and, and so on, <clears throat> had their beginning, were men that believed in evangelism. The loafers and whatnot are not here anymore. Not the ones that started when we started. Only the fellows that pressed the collar, only the ones that gave it their best consistently are still on their feet and still around today. You can't loaf and survive. There's no way to do it. Amen. It is always continuously pouring, pouring yourself out. And all oh, the thrill 
of it all. Praise God. Praise God. I remember leaving a old PAJC conference in Milford. That was the year that Brother Hush was elected. Brother Blankenship was, uh, was not elected. And I left there and went with Brother Cullen Heyman uh, back to Louisiana. Brother Heyman was my first uh, uh, superintendent and uh, district superintendent. I preached a revival for Brother Heyman, and uh, at, he had just opened the church on Drexel Street in uh, uh, Shreveport. The church was still very young. And um, I didn't know anything about knocking doors, but in prayer I felt like I should. I went out and knocked doors and uh, <clears throat> remember so well uh, stepping over a fence and a man was picking uh, potato bugs off of his potatoes and dropping them in a tomato can that had coal oil in it. <clears throat> Some of you folks don't know what coal oil is, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, that took care of the potato bugs. So I walked over to invite him out to church. He never grunted, never said a word to me, never spoke to me. Not one word did he speak, but a big dog underneath the house uh, uh, gave me an adequate reception. He came storming out from there, and uh, I saw him coming. I extended my hand to him as a gesture of friendship, and he obligingly took it and uh, <laughs> kept it for a while. And uh, when I got it back, it was covered with his saliva and with blood, and I... Uh, dried it off with my handkerchief and then again I accented my, my uh, invitation to the man to come out to the revival. He never said a word. He just was still after those bugs. And, um, but those were the days. It's not like that anymore. Uh, old time Pentecost and things of this nature. I know something about some of it and uh, where I am now I like better. Praise God. Amen. God's still the same. The doctrine is still the same. The separation is still the same. Thank God. But we thank the Lord. I know Jesus better now than I knew him then. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm so thankful for that. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm going today to uh, speak uh, from... I'm going to address a need that is present in this congregation. It might be a little different from... the friend of thought this morning, but nevertheless, it's what God wants for now. And it has to do with uh, rejection. It has to do with uh, problems that some here in this uh, congregation face now. And my subject is the removal of humiliation. The removal of humiliation. And Satan takes various things to beat us down and destroy us. At our retreat that just finished lately, I, um, uh, some of the brethren suggested that they put hands on me and pray for me, and uh, I was so glad they did. I have been uh, more or less independent in uh, my activity, and uh, I have uh, taken care of my own self, and I've been a kind of a loner in some situations. But Things in life come along sometimes and they make you appreciate uh, the real things of God more. And as these men came and laid their hands upon me, I appreciated it so much, much more than I would have some time ago. And I cried out to God and I said, God, I receive this. I receive the love that is flowing toward me because I need that love so badly. I receive the strength that is moving from them toward me, God, because I need it so badly, and I need it now, and I'm going to need it tomorrow. I felt somewhat the same kind of spirit a while ago when several of we brethren joined hands and we prayed together, and we held one another's hands for some length of time. Now, I feel uh, actually awkward holding a man's hand. I don't really care for it too much, and... Uh, but uh, I just, I held on to those fellows' hands a while ago because that I, I felt the need of that and, and I felt so, such a need. And I told them and I told several later, I said, I promise you that I will never talk about you and I will never tear you down. That every time I have a chance, I'm going to build you up 
and I'm going to help you, and I'm going to be a friend to you. And I have entered into covenant with several around here already that you can count on me as your friend. And uh, you can count on me for a good word. And I'll say good things about you. And I'll never say anything bad about you. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Oh, we love you, God. We glorify you so much, Lord. We glorify you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Such wonderful things are happening in our fellowship. We have, uh, have had uh, district superintendents on this platform, and they're in the congregation. They love revival. They are for the move of God. They want to know more about Jesus. Things are changing so much. I can remember when we used to be so tremendously impressed by an office, and this just overwhelmed us. It's not so much that way. We are making the main thing the main thing. Praise God. Hallelujah. You might come up on general board members now at conference talking. There is a very good chance that if you walked up, you would find them talking about God and about their service and about the work of God and the move of God. Praise God. And I am so grateful for that. I appreciate so much the... Uh, message from Brother Tenney and from Brother Shoemake and so on. And uh, I'm grateful for that. I know that Brother Tenney wants a move of God. I know that he loves revival. I know that. And uh, I'm grateful for that. And I see that uh, in other places of our fellowship. I will read here today uh, from Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 14. I would quote Isaiah 1.18. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. 14th verse of chapter 14, 2 Samuel. For we must needs die and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth, any God, uh, neither doth God respect any person, Yet he doth devise means that his banish be not expelled from him. For we must needs die, and are his water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that his banish be not expelled from him. You may be seated. <clears throat> Praise God. The removal of uh, humiliation. Some time ago, uh, I read a book that was written by a man that spent much time in the Middle East, and as a result of that, he put together this book, a very good book about the Middle East. Anyone being an authority on this, because of experience, affinity, I would, uh, uh, I would accept him as such. And he spoke about the solution to the Middle East crisis, and the bottom line of it simply was this, that there will be no solution to the Middle East crisis until there comes the removal of humiliation. Until there comes the removal of humiliation. This is the key to the solution of almost any problem, whether it be something that is a, a storm raging in your bosom or whether it be a problem that exists between people in this world. No problem can be solved lastingly, effectively, and really as long as there is humiliation, which is not taken care of and where restoration has not truly uh, been accomplished. I think we are learning that more and more all the time. The humiliation which is a part of the cauldron of death and despair in the Middle East today, of course, had its beginning with the that that was fostered upon Hagar and her son. A cruise of water and a little bread 
get out of my house, leave and don't come back. And taking the boy, she went into the wilderness and thus uh, there was spawned and born the problem that is still with us today. According to the expert that has no solution without the removal of humiliation. The answer to the Middle East, of course, is not more death because that has uh, gone on for some length of time and yet it has not solved anything. The answer to the Jewish problem is not more humiliation. Uh, Hitler tried that. He drugged them down. He, he, uh, he broke them or tried to. He humiliated them to the nth degree. And still there remains in the belly of the nations the Jewish problem, which is not resolved. The only solution for any uh, problem, area, of course, is the removal of humiliation. The root cause of humiliation always uh, comes from rejection and also from failure. A person being rejected or an individual feeling like that they have failed or perhaps that they have actually failed. And so this is the reason for the despair and for the hate and the anger and frustration that drives people in the Middle East to death and to carnage, Be that particular motivation. They have the first five books of the Bible and that's all. There is no place for forgiveness. There is no Calvary, no Gethsemane, no soft words gently spoken. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is not a part of their heritage. They have books of judgment and only five. And consequently, there is no way out of the jungle of uh, their trouble. They bend back upon themselves. They are inverted in every respect, and they, they uh, travel the same path of hate again and again. If you wish today to, uh, to know the city that has the most suicides per capita in the entire United States, you would go to the most religious city of America. Someone, a city that puts up the biggest front, a city that seems to be the most religious, that city is Salt Lake uh, City. This uh, the group of people that claim to have the most perfect home life and so on have more of their young people killing themselves and destroying themselves and other people killing themselves. Why? It's simply because that there is pressed upon them a standard and uh, a system which when they try to live up to without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they fail to live up to it. And moreover, beyond that, they see in the lives of their bishops and elders discrepancies as they grow on up that just, just don't come together. It don't pan out. They are filled with tremendous frustration. They have a great sense of failure, and thus they, uh, they take their lives because there seems to be no other answer. They live in a climate of failure and of humiliation. The very system itself tends to humiliate and they, they react by taking their own life. I've seen in homes children that uh, were constantly pressured uh, by expectations that they could not fulfill and finally getting to the place that they gave up on it and retired into a shell and to an attitude of sullenness and resentment and uh, etc. I've witnessed that in my life and perhaps uh, you have too. And as it's been said here already, it is the devil's business to put us down and to humiliate us and to take us and shove our face in the mud and keep it there. And I really appreciated that scripture, Brother Tinney, from uh, Isaiah, where that uh, people could be made of regular road for the devil to run on and so on. This is exactly what Satan wants. He attempts to humiliate. The man of Gadara is a good example of that. I suppose that he was intellectual, that he had a lot of things going for him, but in time, he ends up in the tombs, he ends up in the caves, he ends up in the most despicable, uh, unwanted place of all the country, and that's where he lived, hating himself to the point that he tried to destruct and to cut himself. He despised his body. He was naked. He was filthy. He was stinking. His spittle hung in his beard. He was an evil man. 
His lonely cry rent the night and startled the fishermen that were near the, uh, the coast, uh, close enough to hear. And there he was, running and racing. Uh, he is a very animal of a man. Until in some of his most lucid moments and rational times, there came from him that lonely wish, Oh, God, help me. And that ear that is attuned to hear the cry of the lonely heard just a mere whisper beyond the hills and the sea and came quickly across the waters to find him there. This man is an example of satanic humiliation and that goes on and on. It's been quite a few years ago we had quite a gathering in Memphis and my wife and myself walking back from the convention that night downtown we turned a corner by a park on our way to our room and a woman was sitting on a park bench. It was around midnight. She was an older woman. Her head, head was tied with a scarf and beside her was a brown bag which I assumed held her liquor. She was already very, very drunk. The gray hair showed out from under her scarf. She had a shabby coat on which was buttoned and she drew around her and she could barely sit up erect. And as we came by, she relieved herself, and uh, this ran down and splattered upon the ground. And uh, I looked at that woman, somebody's mother, somebody's grandmother, and there she sat. The, the shame of it all, and uh, there she was. This is an example also of how that Satan likes to take people and humiliate them. Put them down. Make an animal out of them. Push their face in the mud and do all that he can uh, to discredit them. And Satan takes entire masses of people and humiliates them. Behind the iron curtain, there are rulers that hold millions in captivity, that turn them into uh, uh, to oceans of despair where they prey upon one another. And the suspicions that are engendered in them are not easily dropped, even when they come into a free democratic society. They are still filled with their suspicions and grave misgivings and have no use for an authority figure because they have been uh, put down and humiliated uh, so much. And so uh, it goes. People are humiliated by circumstances over which they have no control. Things that you can't help things that uh, you didn't bring about and things that you didn't want. And I am speaking today to people in this congregation that have known in your lifetime a certain measure of rejection, a certain measure of humiliation. This is the road that Satan likes to walk. This is the door he tries to come through to get into me and to you and to cause you to be less a person than what God wants you to be and what you could be in Him. And I speak here this morning uh, to out of my heart uh, to people that I can relate to because that I know what I'm talking about because I have been there myself. And also I am superintendent of a district that uh, I have seen Satan come to very good men in our district and to put them down. I grieve so much over the little struggling churches, uh, over a wide geographical area that have never known victory, that have known nothing but despair and defeat. And I pray and I pray so much for every preacher and for every one of those churches. For I know it is not God's will that His churches be forever cast down. It is not God's will that His ministers know defeat ever and always. It is not God's will that you always are driven into some corner of dark despair and wade through the, the, the oceans of dark despond. That is not God's will. No, it's not God's will. The devil is a dirty devil. He will take every um, opportunity that he can to put you down and to hum humiliate you. And that is his business and he's very, very happy to do it. In the year of 10, uh, uh, 1053, David lived in Hebron and was in war with the house of Saul. And during that time, he took to himself a woman by the name of uh, Maachiah. And she was the daughter of uh, Talmiah, and Talmiah was the king of Geshur. David was in the vicinity, and he married uh, uh, Talmiah. 
And uh, to that marriage, there were two children that were born. They only had two children. One was named uh, Absalom, and the other was named Tamar. And when Absalom was 21 years of age, and Tamar was 18, there was a very shameful thing that happened in their life. Now this was a prince and a princess and they had their own house to themselves and they had enough assignment to take, uh, make them comfortable and everything was all right with them and everything was fine. But uh, during that time, of course, Ammon uh, lusted after this beautiful girl. Uh, this was two of the perhaps the most handsome and beautiful people in Israel, Tamar and Absalom. They stood out, they were stately and they were beautiful. And so Ammon lusted after Tamar. And of course you knew the, no, the device that he used to get her into his apartment and there he raped her. This beautiful girl, this young 18-year-old girl, left his apartment. Her, her clothes disheveled, perhaps torn. She pulled her cloth up over her head. Uh, she was in shame. She was in shock. And, and she stumbled back toward their own house. And when she came stumbling in that day uh, into the presence of her brother Absalom, and of course she spilled out to him what had happened to her. Now she would be forever marked. She would never have a home like other women. She would never be given in marriage like another woman would be given. The curtain fell in a meaningful way upon her that day. And much of the good that every woman would want now was snatched away. It would never uh, be forthcoming again. And so she poured this story out. And you could imagine Absalom being in a rage at this particular thing. A young man, 21 years of age, and yet he was uh, the member of a princely, of kingly family, and he had his limitations, and there was something, very little he could do. Maybe he had faith in Dad. Dad will take steps, and he'll correct it, and it's going to be all right. But he waited, and he waited, and nothing happened. Nothing was done. And he saw his sister lose weight. He saw the ravages of despair encase her. He saw all of this happen to this beautiful woman and her turn, being turned into an old stumbling crow, even in her, her youthfulness, and her beauty was taken away. And there was anger that grew up and up and up in sight of that man until finally there was the bloody party in which uh, he saw that Ammon was killed and he himself fled the country and went back to uh, uh, the home of his grandfather in Geshur uh, and there he stayed there was nothing for him to do he, uh, he and he just stayed there and three years passed by and Time drug up on him, and the sore festered, and hate grew, and grew, and grew. And finally, Joab saw that David really wanted his son back. And so he, he got a woman up to Koa to come, a wise woman. Living nine Roman miles from Bethlehem in the wilderness, he brought her uh, to the king's palace. And she came in robed in black in sackcloth, and fell before the king, and she said, I need help. I, my husband is dead. I only had two children. Both of them were sons, and they got in a fight. There was nobody to part them. One of the boys killed the other. And now the rest of the family has risen up, and they're demanding the life of the survivor of this encounter. And if they take his life, that means that there is no heritage left of my husband, my deceased husband, and I don't want that. The king said, uh, bring him home. Uh, nothing will happen. And she got out of that king a very great binding promise that not one hair of that man's head would be touched. And when she got that, she said this, you are at fault because you would bring home my son and yet you will not take care of your own son. We must all needs die, and we are as water spilt upon the ground. And yet God does divine, devise means whereby his banish be not expelled from him forever. This is one of the greatest Masonic predictions of the Old Testament. Praise God. And so Joab uh, saw to it that Absalom was brought back. Happy ending. No, it wasn't because there is no ending.
without the removal of humiliation. So Absalom comes back. It's one thing to be in the city. It's another thing, one thing to be in a house. But it's another thing to be in real fellowship. He was not in fellowship. That's right. And so the king didn't even say how to do to him. He didn't say it. And two more years drug by. And he didn't even see the face of his daddy. And so it was that Joab again. There was uh, interaction between Absalom and Joab. And Joab uh, brought, saw to it that, uh, that he was brought into the presence of his father. It w didn't mean very much. It was never really truly fixed. It wasn't. And uh, so a total of seven years of humiliation was put on the top of the handsome head of this man. Now he's 28 years old. He is a man in his own right. But somewhere or another... There was something that was, went wrong in his young life that was not addressed in a good, sound, solid uh, uh, Christian way. And we see the result of it was the death of 40,000 men. A war that scarred Israel until this very day. Until this very day. Yes, sir. Jesus knew something about that. It was only a hump that he saw on the woman's side of the partition in the synagogue that day as he taught. The men were up on one side and the women were up on the other as the custom was. On the woman's side there was a little space that seemed unoccupied. But looking back, he saw only a mound of the flesh and he recognized it as the bent back of someone that could not straighten themselves. He stopped his uh, teaching and asked her to come forward. This woman was discriminated against uh, in as much as she was a part of the uh, put down that belonged to women at that day and time. Also, she was discriminated against by the circumstance of life. She was so bent and she only saw the waste and the filth and the trash of the city. She never saw a bird take its flight. She never saw the rising of the sun. She never saw the sun set. She looked at the dirty uh, street and to the feet, to filthy feet of people and because she could not straighten herself up. And so it was she followed the beckoning of a voice because she had never seen the face of Jesus and was never uh, uh, predicted to see his face. But she came until she stood and looked upon his feet. And it was then that he touched her, her bent back. He felt the, uh, the tense muscles. He felt the misshapen bone structure. He felt that. And then he did something. He addressed himself to the root of the matter. And he said, Thy spirit of infirmity come out of her. He knew that there was a reason why her face was only about one foot from the ground. He knew there was a reason why that no sunshine came into her life. And no beauty was beheld by her eyes. He knew that. And I don't know how it started. It must have started far back in her life with some seed, some act, some deed of humiliation that was never fixed and never addressed. And it grew and this was a tool that the devil took to heap humiliation upon humiliation and drive her down, down, down until she was so shamed and bent until she could not straighten herself. It was a spirit. Certainly it was. Don't tell me the psychosis and the spirit of an individual has no effect upon their physical. How many of us sitting here today know that there's couples after couples that wanted a, a baby and couldn't have a baby? Not until they adopted a baby. And when they brought this baby into their home and the love that was there and the certain relaxing of anxiety and so on, it also affected their, their physical and they were able to produce children. Yes, sir, we are whole people, my friend. We are whole people. And I have news for you today. Jesus Christ came. That everybody sitting in this building could be made every whit whole. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
The prayer of the Apostle Paul says, May the God of peace sanctify you wholly, both body and soul and spirit. Praise God. The Lord wants you to stand strong and in confidence, a whole person, a total person. Praise God. That is confident and sure in your faith in God and the calling that He has given to you. Praise the Lord. Yes, He does. Yes, He does. Praise God. Isaiah 53 said, He took our infirmities. Yes, He did. Yes. How, whatever infirm situation might be in my life or your life, rest assured that the Lord stepped forward to take that and assume that. He did. We are humiliated by the actions of other people. Not only circumstance over which we have no control, but uh, we are humiliated some, aided sometimes by the action of other people. In the fourth chapter of uh, Second Samuel, uh, you will find the account of the wounding of an individual that they never recovered from. The, the falling of uh, Jonathan's grandson and so that his legs were broken. Both of those legs were broken. It must have been a tremendous fall. He and the nurse were running and the record has it that he fell down and both of his legs were broken. And in the process of time, of course, they grew back. But there was no way of splinting. They didn't know that. I can see that fella as his legs were twisted and, and they were pained and they, they swelled and it looked like that he was going to die or he's going to lose them, gangrene or something. The screams, the screams, the screams of those broken legs. And finally, somehow or other, the bone takes hold and grows back in such a crooked, uh, grotesque way. And he is very, very ugly. And for 16 years, he puts up with that. The pain of it and the humiliation of it and the ugliness of it. And he lived like that. Now, he had nothing to do with the war between the house of Saul and the house of David. It was a circumstance that over which he had no control. And it was uh, because of someone else and so on. But whatever has happened to you, my friend, I preach about a Christ that can relate to, what, uh, to that. And he knows, he understands. He hung naked. We see him modestly with a loincloth uh, draped about him. But evidently it was not so. They hung him up with nothing. And Jesus was modest. He was righteous. Uh, he was good. He went about doing good. He hung in shame. He hung uh, with every violation of, of his values uh, being violated. The cup was sour. He tasted the dregs of betrayal. And all of the shame and ignominy that could be brought to the lips and the being of a human, he, it was pressed into his mouth and into his life. He took the cup. Yes, he did. He took it. He was humiliated. He was drastically humiliated. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Praise God. You know, <clears throat> Satan has a way of coming to us in such insidious, devious ways sometimes and, and to take our, our faith away. If our heart condemn us not, we have confidence toward God. Now, the devil don't care what he condemns you with. It could be a lie or, or truth. It doesn't matter just so he condemns you. And he, if he can get guilt into you, he has destroyed your faith. Because you can't have faith and have guilt at the same time. And uh, so he, he goes about to do that. Uh, a good time before I uh, uh, came to know the meaning of uh, justification and the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the grace of God, the wonderful heritage that we so much enjoy, Satan took advantage of uh, my failures, and I have so very, very many failures, so many failures, and he would condemn me by that and because of that. And one of the things that he would bring to me at times that I just couldn't cope with was uh, something that, uh, that uh, it was the worst thing that he could have put in my mind. Now, my, uh, I loved my mother very much, and... Uh, I uh, just really, truly did. I never left the house if I was going somewhere, the town or whatnot, without kissing her. I came home, I kissed my mother. I think that's a great thing for all children to love their mother. Praise God. And my teaching my children, I have 
took the position, I don't know that you'll ever love me. And that's not for me to worry about. My place in the home is to have order and to see that you respect your mother and you respect certain things about this house. And I'm not to worry about whether you love me or not. Later on, when you get older, you will love me. When you get to where that you can rightly evaluate things, but you must love your mother. And I have observed that boys that love their mother never wander very far. Praise God. If they truly love their mother, praise God. Hallelujah. Could we say praise the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so I remember the cemetery so vividly in, in Noble, Louisiana. That cemetery has not changed so little in the last uh, <clears throat> 60 years. It, it's just, it's like it was the, I remembered it when they pulled my dad through there uh, when I was four years old and my dad was buried. And when my mom came along later and she was buried there, uh, same cemetery, same lettering above the gate was there when they buried my dad. The same cedar tree is just to the left of the gate uh, uh, that was there when they buried my dad. And uh, there it is, same old cemetery, so little, so little change. Now my mom and dad is buried to, in the corner cemetery just to the right as you go into the gate. And that is the old, that's the family plot there. And, uh, but there used to be times that uh, the devil in my nighttime would put a dream into my mind that would, would just shame me and bother me. I would dream that I was in the noble cemetery and uh, there was a cluster of people, about six, and they would be digging uh, up a grave and uncovering a grave. Same number of people, same place. It wasn't in the corner, but it was over to the left, just past the cedar tree. And uh, here they would be uncovering that grave. I would be on the periphery. I would look and I would say, and after a while I'd say, what uh, is happening here? What's going on? And then someone would volunteer to me. Um, they're uncovering this grave. They're digging up this uh, corpse. What, uh, well, what, why? Because that they believe that this woman that was buried here was killed by her son. And uh, <clears throat> they are digging her up in to uh, verify it. And, well, who is the woman? And then they would say, that woman is Lucy Pugh. And then it would come to me. I killed my mother. And the impression would come, you killed your mother. And all the shame and the guilt that would come down over me, that would just take sleep from my eyes, and uh, it would bother me. The guilt, nameless guilt. Guilty about what? Man, I couldn't think of anything. I'd put it all under the blood. I didn't have, but it didn't. Jesus said the devil was a liar and that he was a liar from the beginning. The Holy Ghost witnesses to me right now that I preach to somebody here. That the devil is on your trail to humiliate you. To push you down, to lie to you, and to take from you the highest and the best that God has for you. Praise God. I want you to know that I feel within my heart today such great compassion for you. I feel in my heart today such love. And that love is not moving just this way. There is love that moves laterally across this building here today. Praise God. Did you know that some of the blessings of God just can't come perpendicular up in just my relationship with God? The Bible speaks about the members of God's body being joined together by bands and joints. And uh, that's, of course, our relationships. We are joined by our relationships. And the Bible said that nourishment is brought to that member because of the bands and the joints. Of course, between our, the end of our finger and our shoulder, there are several bands and joints that finally... In, uh, link that finger onto the hand and every one of those relationships is important if that uh, member is to survive so it is sometimes my good people I cannot receive from God what I ought to receive unless it be emulated and demonstrated through the flesh of his body 
And so sometimes blessing has got to flow this way. Back and forth through the body. Sometimes I feel the Spirit this way. And sometimes I feel it coming this way. And this way. And moving through me to somebody else. And there is a cleansing in it. And there is a strength in it. Praise God. Yes, there is. Rejection is a common lot of individuals. And it is a way of life. Someone says, I've been rejected. Friend, join the club. Who hasn't? And if you haven't, you're going to be. Amen. Because in school, that uh, when some were chosen and some not chosen for the Sandlot ball team and so on, you begin to learn something about rejection then. And that's going to go on. It's just a process of life. It, it's not the fact you have it or don't have it. It's how you meet it and how you cope with it. Praise God. I went to meet a man the other day, and I knew this man hated me. I knew he hated me. And uh, so <clears throat> he didn't have any reason to hate me. But, uh, but uh, I knew that he did. I received enough feedback from other sources to, of uh, his uh, remarks and all to know that he did. And um, so I prayed before I went. And I said, Lord, fill me up with your love. Oh, God, fill me with your love. Flow through me, oh, Lord, with the love of God. <laughs> Praise God. So when I came into that man's office, he was a, he was a tough guy. He, provided, he, he prided himself in his physical ability. I could take one look at him and know that he, was, he would have been a, a, a fearful man to encounter, either in karate or wrestling or boxing or whatnot. And there he sat, and he, he's a fellow that... Uh, he, he's just kind of sick inside on that thing. And, and there he, he likes to glare people down. So I came into his office. He didn't rise from his chair, and he glared at me. And he turned the hate valves on. And uh, he ran out to a, a good stream of hate there. Just sit there, you know, and run out his hate. And then I turned the love valve on. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. And I loved him. And I smiled at him. Praise God. And I just loved him. And I felt love pouring through me across that desk. I felt love flowing toward him. Praise God. Praise God. I thought to myself, oh, buddy, you're going to get a whooping today. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because love is stronger than hate. And all of those lies and all of that crud that the devil has fed me all of my life, you know, about rejection and so on. I came across a scripture one time that uh, in the first chapter of Ephesians and it told me something. And I never have forgotten it and I remind myself. It said simply that, uh, that you are accepted in the beloved. Praise God. Man, don't try to reject me. I'm accepted. Praise God. No way. And that's in heaven, and you can't do nothing about that. Praise God, I am an accepted man. And I thought about that, and I looked across that, uh, to that fellow. I thought to myself, you poor fellow, you're trying to reject me here. And man, I was accepted in the beloved before the foundation of the world. And nothing you can do about it. Man, I'm an accepted man. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes we are humiliated by our own uh, actions. And, of course, the fallen state of man is utter. It is so absolute and uh, it's awful. And there's no way that you can describe how utter it is. I know that I'm incapable of any sin that anybody else is. Now, I tell you what, friend, I'm, I'm tired of the judgment seat. I'm tired of that. I don't, have any, I don't have any place there. There are some things that I have to do and all like that. Some things I've got to do in district work and that I don't enjoy. But I tell you, I can say of a truth that I love. I truly love, praise God. And I like it that way. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord. Glory to God. Praise God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah!
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I would like for us to turn in our Bibles, and I'd like for you to turn to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now, in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, there are, <clears throat> there are two divisions. One part of Deuteronomy has to do with the blessings that comes to people if they obey the law. And when you read it, it sounds so good. And it is good. And I would like to be absolutely included in all of that. I won't have time to read that entire chapter. It is a long chapter. It has, it has a total of 68 verses in it. He starts off, he said, and it should come to pass that if, and let's all say if, yes. if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe all, let's say all, all, if and all. Now, that's, that's important. You do them all. And if you do, if you do, and he starts listing, I'll set you in high places, uh, verse uh, 1, and uh, that's the first blessing. Second blessing, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Uh, verse uh, 3 is the third blessing. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. And right on down, 4 and 5. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. Blessed shall that be thy basket in thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in. Blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Uh, the, the eleventh blessing, verse 7, The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee, to be smitten before thy face. Terrific. And then coming on down to the ninth verse, If you will keep the law, these things will happen. And then the twelfth blessing in the tenth verse, and the thirteenth blessing in the twelfth verse. You're going to get all the rain you need. And finally the fourteenth blessing in the thirteenth verse. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above uh, uh, only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou shalt hearken unto the commandment, and so on. Now that, that's great, 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 great. But then he drops down to the 15th verse, and there is that, that shocking, arresting conjunction, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command thee this day, that all these things, curses. Now here comes that word all again. It was all blessings. Now it's all curses shall come to you, contingent on you doing all these things. And then he starts uh, ticking off the curses. Sixteenth verse is the first curse, and seventeenth is the third curse, and the fourth, eighteenth is the fourth curse, and the fifth curse, and the sixteenth curse is in the eighteenth verse, and the nineteenth uh, verse has the seventh curse, and the twentieth verse has the eighth curse, and the twenty-first verse the ninth curse, and the twenty-second a verse that uh, the tenth curse and the twenty-third verse the eleventh curse and the twenty-fourth verse the twelfth curse and twenty-fifth verse the thirteenth curse uh, verse twenty-six the fourteenth curse uh, verse seventeen the fifteenth curse uh, verse twenty-eight the sixteenth uh, uh, curse and the the uh, twenty-ninth verse the seventeenth curse the eighteenth curse is in the thirtieth verse nineteenth curse is also in the thirtieth uh, verse the twentieth curse is in the thirtieth verse the twenty-first curse Curses in the thirty-first verse. Twenty-second curses in the thirty-first verse. Twenty-third curses in the uh, the thirty-first verse. Twenty-fourth uh, curse in the thirty-second verse. Dear God, uh, drop down to the forty-first. You find the thirty-second curse, and then in the forty-second uh, uh, verse, the uh, thirty-third uh, curse. In the forty-third uh, verse, the thirty-fourth curse. Let's uh, go to the fifty-third verse. There you'll find the thirty-eighth curse, and then finally in the fifty-fourth verse, the thirty. The ninth curse, the fortieth uh, curse in the fifty sixth verse, the um Forty-first curse in the sixtieth verse, the forty-fourth curse in the sixty-fourth uh, uh, verse, and finally the forty-fifth curse in the sixty-fifth verse. There were fifteen blessings and forty-five curses. There were three curses for every blessing. And that's the place that I lived, where I got three for one. That's right. And I was under the law. And if you keep them all, you'll get 
these. You'll get one blessing. If you disobey it, you're going to get three curses. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. And friend, I cannot stand here today and tell you that J.T. Pugh is lily white and that I have kept the law. Consequently, what happened? I lived in a state of humiliation, of defeat, of failure, of put down. I had a road right into my life that Satan walked freely, coming in with his tough loads of guilt to dump on me and saying, you did it, you did it, you did it. And I'd have to say, yes, I did. Yes, I did. I'm a failure. 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 And I live like that. I live like that. Praise God. I'd like for us to turn to the third chapter of Galatians. Let the Bible speak. Praise God. And let every man be a liar. Praise the Lord. Let us take our position in the Scripture. Let us take our place at the foot of Calvary. Let us be accepted in the Beloved. If God be for us, who can be against us? Praise God. Praise God. Third chapter of Galatians. Verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law under the curse. <laughs> That's where I was. That's where I was. And I was there even after I received the Holy Ghost because I just simply didn't know any better. And they didn't teach me that. And they didn't preach that to me then. And uh, it, the, we were in, it was inferred that if you get good enough, you'll go to heaven. If you get good enough, you'll get the Holy Ghost. If you don't get it, it's because there's something wrong with you. You haven't repented of yet. And so on. And so we, we were under condemnation constantly. Same doctrine. Same standard. As far as salvation is concerned. No compromise. Let's all say no compromise. no compromise. But friend, it's all in Jesus. Let's say Jesus. Jesus. Let's say it again. Jesus. Let's say it again. Jesus. Let's read some of the good word again. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written. There's that word all again. All things written in the book of the law. And friend, I didn't continue in all of them. But that no man is justified by the law. And I never was and I never did feel like I was good enough to go to heaven. And I'm not good enough now to go to heaven. But my faith stands in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Praise God. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Glory. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. No, it isn't. You know what faith, how faith comes? Faith worketh by love. That's scripture. Faith doesn't work by law. Faith works by love. The man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Hey! Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Glory! I'm accepted, friend. Don't try to reject me. I'm accepted. Glory! I'm accepted. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. The only way to get from under the law is not by breaking, by not breaking the law, but by coming to Jesus. And He will lift you above the law. And you'll keep the law better than you ever kept the law when you were under the law. Praise God. Praise God. And you'll never solve your problems by looking at it, but look to the solution, which is Jesus Christ. He is the solution. Thank God. He was made a curse for me. 
Praise God. Our problem is not to defeat Satan. He's already been defeated. Praise God. You don't have to keep on paying for something that's already been paid for. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I was associated with a church one time. It was a small church. I'll say this in closing here. They, people knew each one, the other, real well, too well. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, there was a lot of pluses and a lot of minuses in a situation like that. And uh, one family and another family were very close together. They walked back home from church together. This is uh, in the country, no, not even a light. You kind of looked up through the trees and you mapped your way according to the skyline of the trees. And uh, they th I remember when the action came out on cars. They thought they really had something. But uh, we knew knee action back then. We'd step off in holes and we knew how to compensate. And uh, <laughs> we'd, just, we'd just keep going. Fair sell them fall down. And uh, folks, they went home that way. And uh, it was a long way home. And when they got to the first family's house, they would stop and they'd drop a good cold bucket of well water and had, get them a drink and sit down on the porch a little bit. And then they'd pick up the kids if they had any sleep by that time and get on down to the next place and home. And uh, one night, you're in the process of getting home, carrying the children, dragging the others, well, uh, it was alleged that, uh, that one of the boys had uh, raped a girl of the other family. I don't know whether it was so, don't know what. Anyway, there was a horrible situation. It was a court situation. And, and uh, that uh, boy was sent to the penitentiary. And he stayed in there. And it was a horrible breach that came in that church. And half of the folks sat on one side of the aisle, half on the other, ones that were sympathetic to what not, and there it was. And so the work of God for that little seminar came to a screeching halt, and, and uh, it uh, was that way. Oh, it was awful. And that went on for years. And the boy came home. He was determined to have his head up, and everything's going to be all right, and he came back home. And uh, I remember so well when... He came. Things were tight, tight. And he was a handsome fellow. He was a good he was a good man. He was a good man. And he met hostility and he met reality. And he just bruised him, bruised him, bruised him. He hadn't been out of the penitentiary for a while until he paralyzed from somewhere up around the shoulders. The rest of his body paralyzed. And so the family had to take care of him. And uh, People said there was nothing wrong with him. They made the remarks, and, and they laughed. And, and They built him out a little house because he, nights and days were mixed up, and he put him in the corner of the yard in that little house so that he could have his own schedule. And They said that there was really nothing wrong with him. But there's a big storm came up one day and blew that house away and tumbled him across the yard, piled him up against the fence on the other side, and partially covered him with hail. He never helped himself he just couldn't he was paralyzed They'd drag him out of there and get him cleaned up and, and so on pretty well convinced people that uh, he was paralyzed and that continued until one night one of the mothers of one family crossed no man's land that aisle during the process of service walked over across the other aisle and came to the woman that used to be a very dear friend and uh put her arms around her and said, I accept blame and, and uh, I'm sorry. I want it back like it used to be and uh, let's please forgive and, and so on. They're moved through the congregation laterally love. Now, this is, this is why the, the body needs to be healthy because there needs to be this, this flow sometimes because people can't help themselves. And so... It was such a time of rejoicing. 
And then it wasn't but a matter of a few weeks after that, Mom in the kitchen making up the biscuit dough. You ever see a big wooden dough pan and you ever hear a woman make up a lot of biscuit and you could hear wop, 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 wop. And uh, <clears throat> putting that dry flour on the outside and then after a while you start pinching those biscuits off and uh, putting them in the... Well, she was busy with that. She heard a step behind her and when she turned, there stood that son of hers on his feet smiling. Hi, Mom. I'm walking in. He was not paralyzed anymore because of the removal of humiliation. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Brother B.H. McCoy pastors a church that I pastored for 17 years in Port Arthur. He's done a good job. H. McCaw is a good man. He has a tremendous amount of ability. He has a good education. He told me, he said, he was talking one day. He just opened himself up. He said, I've always had a problem with weight. And I don't eat all that much, but I've battled weight since as far back as I can remember. And I was made fun of in school. We lived, he said, way out in the country. There wasn't even on a road to our house. When you got to the end of a particular lane, you looked over the ridge and you could see the top of our house. And there was a, actually a fence and we had to put our groceries through the fence and walk through another man's cornfield and pack our stuff over to our house and said, um, I battle with a lot of that. Finally, he said, when I got my first job and I was selling feed to chicken houses in East Texas and I was so beat down and so shy and cowed and my weight and everything until he said, I remember one particular farm that had quite a few chickens. It would mean a lot to be able to get their order. He said, I drove my car back and forth across the front of that lane there, and I just didn't have the courage to get my foot on the brake and slow it down and turn that car into that lane because I was so cowed and so I have rung somebody's bell right there you said, I would like to go meet so-and-so. I would like to do this, and I would like to do that and the other. But the old devil keeps running a big wagon load of something right into your life over and over again. Hey, my brother, you are accepted. I've got news for you. You are accepted. <laughs> Praise God. I said, Brother McCoy, you've done so much for God, and you... You, you just got a good head and all of that. And I said, how have you managed all of that? Now listen to his reply. Listen to his reply. He said, I faced all of my realities in Jesus Christ. I faced all of my realities in Jesus Christ. Friend, if he's not the answer, there is no answer. He's been a friend to me. Never leave you. Never forsake you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Let's worship Him. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Glory to God.